coach said of him that he was just the best 
she said that he had told her he was going to get a divorce and then they were going to get married, the two of them, and have kids and she was, you know, pretty happy about the whole thing. Not happy about the murder, but she was looking forward to having this wonderful life with him.
said, hey, somebody else had access to my computer, I guess. It wasn't me. The spray paint on the wall. They found that he had purchased the same exact paint a couple months earlier. Okay, that's a little circumstantial. A handwriting analyst said that his handwriting was the same as the spray paint on the wall. It's not perfect science, right? They found that the bodies had to have been already deceased before he ever went to the gym that morning, meaning he claims he left the house at 5.40 a.m. and his family was alive. When he called his neighbor, it was around quarter to seven. So, it was pretty obvious that the bodies were already at such a state of rigor mortis that they had been dead since at least 3 a.m. They found uh, DNA under Sherry's fingernails, but for whatever reason, it, it could not pinpoint him exactly. It pinpointed, you know, a certain percentage, but it wasn't high enough to say for sure it was him. So that wasn't very useful. And they had found on his computer lots and lots of X-rated stuff being exchanged between himself and Tara. They also found a very strange and detailed list about Tara. Almost like a spreadsheet, sort of. They found that nine days before the appearance of the first threatening email was the date that he had marked as being the day that Tara changed my life. She changed his life, and then he hatched this whole plan shortly after. Also, the basement window was left unlocked. That's where the neighbor got in on the morning of the murder. Now, if he knew that he was getting all these threats, and he is a head of security, why would he leave a basement window unlocked? But even after all these details, it's all circumstantial, right? There was no exact DNA. There was no video footage of the murder. There was no witness. There was no murder weapon, you know. So the jury had a really rough time, for whatever reason, until, you know, they were deliberating, so it was the end of everything. It was, it was the end of the presentation of all the witnesses and the evidence and everything, so for whatever reason, they noticed in the, you know, evidence that they were allowed to look at, they found a couple of photos that actually were not supposed to be there. They were stuck to the back of something else. So there was like two photos of Chris and Tara. And on the back of these photos, it said October something, uh, 2008. Now, Chris had said they started dating in November not October. So for whatever reason, that was like a big aha moment to the jurors. And they were like, hey, he lied about that. We can't trust him. He must have done it. So 
reason was because they weren't supposed to have this evidence. That was what made them actually make their decision. It was based on evidence they weren't supposed to have. And his lawyer never got a chance to even come back to them about that evidence. You know, he wasn't able to say, hey, that was a mistake, was written on the back, or whatever. There was no further discussion at that point because they were already in the deliberation period. So I understand exactly, you know, what he is saying. But, I mean, come on. Do we need another trial to go through this again? It's pretty clear to most of us. And luckily for the taxpayers, the uh, petition for a new trial was denied. So that is how the case stands. So, what do you think? this like the Chris Watts case? Well, Chris Watts was found guilty of murdering his wife and two children, plus his wife's unborn child because she was pregnant. And he did it because he had a new girlfriend and he wanted a new life, you know, which is kind of the same as this Chris Coleman murdered his family so he could start a fresh life with Tara and still
his parents. 